In this video, I want to look at a couple applications of electrochemistry. So the first one, I want to talk about batteries. And we had said previously that batteries are just an example of a galvanic cell. And we're going to look specifically at lead storage batteries, which are car batteries. All different types of batteries are example of galvanic cells. They just use different chemical equations, right? Remember, galvanic cells use a spontaneous chemical equation to produce our electric current, right? We're converting chemical energy to electric energy. Our lead storage battery is going to involve lead. If you were to look at a lithium ion battery, it's going to involve lithium ions, right? Nickel cadmium involves nickel and cadmium. So different types of batteries involve different chemical reactions, but all of them are applications of galvanic cells. So our lead storage battery, let's actually write this here, an example of a galvanic cell. So the equation that we use for this one is lead solid going to PbO2 plus lead to sulfate. And then this does occur in sulfuric acid, H2SO4. So we're going to assign oxidation numbers. We're going to look to see what's being oxidized, what's being reduced. We're going to balance it using sulfuric acid. We're going to determine which reaction occurs at the anode and the cathode. So oxidation numbers first. So anything in its elemental form we said has an oxidation number of zero. So lead solid is just zero. Here oxygen is a minus two, right? It's not in a peroxide or bonded to fluorine. There's two of them, so that's a minus two total, which means lead must be a plus four, so that way it sums to zero. For lead sulfate, I'm actually going to take into account that this is an ionic compound. And you wouldn't have to separate it this way. You could keep it together and still get the correct answer. But I know if lead is a monoatomic ion with a negative, positive two charge, its oxidation number is going to be plus two. Right, if you wanted to do it the other way, I have minus two for oxygen. There's eight of them, or sorry, there's four of them, so minus eight total. I have plus two for lead, so sulfur would be a plus six. So my oxidation step, Remember, if something's being oxidized, it's losing electrons. My oxidation number is going to get bigger. So I'm going to have lead going to lead sulfate. I'm going to get rid of these because we don't need them. So PB solid going to PbSO4. And again, I know these are not balanced, right? I don't have sulfur over here, but I have sulfur over here. We will balance them. We'll get that sulfur by using our sulfuric acid. My reduction, this is gaining electrons, so my oxidation number gets smaller, so it's going to be this one going to this one. So PbO2 going to lead to sulfate. So we're going to balance these. And then because we're using sulfuric acid, I know sulfuric acid is a strong acid, so it's going to dissociate into hydrogen ions and bisulfate ions, HSO4 minus, and then we are in aqueous solution, so we can use water. So those are the things that we can add pretty much wherever we want to be able to balance our equations. So let's balance these. My oxidation one first. So PBS going to PBSO4. So using our steps for balancing our oxidation reduction reactions, we want to balance everything other than oxygen and hydrogen first. So lead already is, sulfur isn't. To get sulfur balanced, I'm going to add my bisulfate ion. So I'm going to have an HSO4 minus over on my reactant side. So I have one sulfur, one sulfur, one lead, one lead. So that's good. 
I have four oxygen and four oxygen. Here I have a hydrogen, so I need to add H plus over to my product side. And then get a balanced charge. So on my reactant side, I have a plus one charge total. Here I have, sorry, a minus one total. There's a minus one here. On my product side, I have a plus one. So to balance that charge, I'm gonna add two electrons to my product side, right? I now have two negatives and one positive, so that's a minus one total. Here I have a minus one, so we're good. My other half reaction, PBO2 solid, going to PBSO4. Lead's already balanced. We need to balance our sulfur, so another bisulfate ion. I'm gonna balance oxygen next. Here I have two oxygen, here I have four, so that gives me six total on my reactant side. On my product side, I only have four. So we're gonna balance oxygen by adding water. I'm short two oxygen, so two water. I now have four hydrogen. On this side, I only have one hydrogen, so I need to add three hydrogen. And then to balance my charge by adding electrons, here I have no net charge, so a net charge is zero. I have three positives and one negative, so plus two. Adding two electrons will give me a net charge of zero. So those are my two balanced half reactions, right? This one here is my anode, right? It's my oxidation. This is what occurs at my cathode. It's my reduction. Let's add them together. So my two electrons are canceling. This proton will cancel one of those three, leaving me two, and then we'll add our bisulfates together. So I have two protons plus two HSO4 minus plus lead solid plus PBO2 solid going to two lead sulfate plus two water. That's also solid and then water is a liquid. So that would be my cell reaction or my overall net equation for this. Sometimes if you see this in other sources, sometimes this will actually be written as four hydrogen ions and then two sulfate ions, right? Remember this is a weak acid, so this can also lose a proton. So if I have two of those, I can get two more protons and then two SO4, two minuses. So depending on the pH of our solution, sometimes it is completely dissociated. So if you see it written using this instead of this, that's a perfectly acceptable way to write this equation. So each cell, if we talk specifically kind of about the car battery or our 12 volt batteries, each cell is about two volts. I think it's like 1.9 something, but it's pretty close to two volts. So generally we're gonna have six cells per battery, which is gonna give us the 12 volts that our lead storage battery normally has. And then again, this is the chemical equation, right? If we were to separate these out into their two half cells, right, we could draw an example of this battery. I'm gonna have this in my anode compartment. I'm gonna have this in my cathode compartment. And then these electrons are gonna move from, right, this anode compartment to this cathode department. When it does that, it's producing that electric current. So my spontaneous, chemical reaction, right, it has a positive cell potential, a negative free energy change. This is going to create the electric current that actually starts our car or whatever you're using the battery for.
once the car is running then, the reaction is actually reversed. Remember electrolytic cells, which we will talk about in the next video, that's where we use an electric current to drive a non-spontaneous reaction, right? So in the forward direction, it's spontaneous, meaning in the reverse direction, it's non-spontaneous. So once the car is running, our reaction can actually be reversed and we can end up recharging our battery. Right? This is a solid, right? so it can actually precipitate on our electrodes and serve to go in the reverse direction. So once the car is running, or if you have a battery recharger, the reaction is reversed. So the battery is recharged. Not all batteries are actually capable of being recharged. It really just depends what that chemical reaction is. Right here, our lead sulfate, lead two sulfate is solid. So it does pre precipitate. on the electrodes, right? That's gonna make it rechargeable. The second application of electrochemistry that I wanna talk about in this video is corrosion. Those are both R's, believe it or not. And corrosion, by definition, it's the oxidative, so this is it's being oxidized, right? It's the oxidative deterioration of a metal, right? So deterioration of a metal, you could say, by an electrochemical process. So the example I want to look at is actually solid iron, and then we're going to combine it with oxygen, and we're going to end up forming rust. And we actually need both oxygen and water. We can't just have oxygen and have it effectively rust. That's why cars in Arizona actually don't rust as much as cars in Michigan, um, where it's quite humid. So requires both oxygen and water. So dry climates, you don't see quite as much. And again, we did say it was an electrochemical process. And what's gonna happen is that iron is going to be oxidized, right? It's the oxidative deterioration. So iron is oxidized. in one region of the metal and oxygen is reduced in another region. Remember when we drew our examples of our Daniel cells, we separated the oxidation and the reduction process. So this is all happening on the same piece of metal, but they're happening in slightly different regions. We end up actually with pits in the metal from the, ox or from the iron being oxidized, and then the rust is actually deposited in a location that's not where that pit is. So we're oxidizing it and we're reducing oxygen in slightly different locations. Our anode region Remember our anode is our oxidation. Iron is being oxidized, so this is going to be iron solid going to iron plus 2 plus two electrons, right? I don't have any oxygen or hydrogen to balance. So this is balanced. And if we were to look up our reduction potential for this, I get 0.45 volts. My cathode region, this is where the reduction is happening, remember? Is 
I have oxygen, that's supposed to be a G, and then it's forming water. And then to balance that, we actually would need four protons and four electrons, and we end up producing water. And then the oxidation half cell potential for this one is 1.23 volts. So if you were to look this up on this table of standard reduction potentials, right, it would be written in the opposite form. It would have a negative 1.23 volts, and then you would switch the sign. So then remember, electrons are being produced at my anode, right? It's a product. We're losing electrons. We're giving them off. And then those electrons are actually supplied, right, to my cathode region. So the electrons needed for the reduction of oxygen are supplied by a current that actually flows through the metal to the iron. Oh, sorry, to, from the iron, not to the iron, right? Iron's producing them and it's flowing to this half reaction. And of course, if we were to balance this, right, we would have to get our electron counts equal. So I would have two of all of these and then four electrons. Because of the inconsistencies in the metal, it actually allows for some regions to be more easily oxidized than others. So the areas that are more easily oxidized are going to serve as these anode compartments. That's where we're going to produce those electrons. And then again, those are the electrons that are going to be given to oxygen to reduce it to water. And this is going to be kind of an ugly picture, but I'm going to do my best here. It's just we're going to try to fit a lot into it. So this is going to be a super thick piece of iron metal. So this is representing my iron metal. And then I'm actually going to put a little pit in it where it's being oxidized. So this is going to be my anode region. And in my anode region, right, that's where I'm going to have this process occurring. So I'm going to have my iron going to iron two plus, plus my two electrons, right? In the pit, if we think about this, I have iron solid and now I don't have iron solid, right? So some of this metal is forming iron ions, right? So that's why we have less metal here. That's why we get those pits. It's because I'm taking some of the solid and I'm turning it into ions. I don't have solid anymore. So those iron ions then are going to migrate away from that pitted anode region. They're going to come into contact with oxygen in the water droplets, and then they're going to be oxidized to iron plus three. Rust, and I'll write that down in a minute, but if we go back up here to rust, I didn't write down the chemical formula, but rust is actually iron three oxide, and it's actually a hydrate of it. So it has a water attached with it. So this is iron with a three plus charge, right? There's two of them. And then I have three oxygen with a two minus charge. So rust itself is actually iron three plus. If we look at our equation here, we're producing iron two plus. So these iron two plus ions here, they're actually moving away from this pit. They're going to come into contact with more oxygen when that happens, I'm going to further oxidize them to iron three plus. That's then going to combine with the oxygen and water to produce rust. So let's actually write some of that down. My picture is not complete. There's going to be quite a bit more that I'm going to add to it here. So the iron two plus ions migrate away. from the pitted anode and when they come into contact oxygen in the water droplet I am going to add water to this picture I just haven't yet
they are further oxidized. to iron three plus. So our chemical reaction for that is I have four iron two plus plus oxygen plus four protons going to four iron three plus plus six protons. And then if you wanted to, oops, sorry, I wrote that down wrong. <laughs> Those protons would have canceled, right? If I had six protons over here and the four over here, some of those would cancel and that's how I knew I wrote it down wrong. I actually have two water, sorry about that. So the reason why I have four is just from balancing it, right? If I have oxygen here, we had to add two water to this side to get it to balance, I then needed four protons here right to balance those four hydrogen ions and then balancing charge we end up with four electrons and so on those hydrogen sorry those iron three plus sorry if i'm getting too confusing here these iron two plus then do react with water and then just in the process of balancing it we end up with four iron three plus in four water, and then that's going to produce my rust. So again, so far I've only talked about the anode, right? In the anode, I'm taking iron solid we're forming iron two plus ions. So we're losing some solid, so I end up with this pit. I haven't talked about these electrons yet. I've only talked about these iron two plus. So those iron two plus again, are going to come into contact with oxygen. They're gonna be further oxidized to iron three plus. That iron three plus then combines with water to produce rust. Remember we said we need both oxygen and water to do this. So this is kind of where that water is becoming important. So I am gonna draw a big old water droplet on here. That's what this thing's representing. This is water. So these iron two plus ions, right? They're leaving. So these are just these, right? They're migrating away from that pitted area, right from my anode. And then they're gonna combine with oxygen. So oxygen's gonna combine with them. We're gonna produce iron three plus. And then eventually from that, we're gonna end up with rust, which gets deposited. This is my Fe203, so that's my rust. Meanwhile, we still have our reduction half reaction to look at. So over in a separate region, I'm going to have this cathode. And that's actually it up a little bit higher. I'm going to have my cathode region. So oxygen is going to react with four protons. I'm just copying down this half reaction plus four electrons to produce my two water. And then those electrons, right, are going from here to here. If you have dissolved salts, that actually increases the conductivity of the water, which accelerates the corrosion. So if you live in an area where you get a lot of snow, a lot of times they'll use salt on the roads to help melt the snow. That salt, however, is going to increase the conductivity of the water and is going to increase rusting. So not only do you get more rust in humid areas, but in places where there's a lot of salt on the roads, you're also going to get increased rust.